something like this, right? You mentioned that you already worked in package manager in the past, but how do you do something like this? And how uh, does it look like to develop a package manager from scratch? Yeah, so I wouldn't really say like from scratch it's, it's true, but uh, I think a package manager also always comes with like another part and that's really the community around it. Hello and welcome to the PyBytes podcast where we talk about Python, career and mindset. We're your hosts, I'm Julian Sequeira. And I am Bob Beldebos. If you're looking to improve your Python, your career, and learn the mindset for success, this is the podcast for you. Let's get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the PyBytes podcast. I'm Bob Beldebos, and I'm here with Robin and Wolf Volprecht, who uh, currently works at prefix.dev and is also working on a very exciting package manager project called Pixie. And today, um, yeah, we're going to pick his brain about that and uh, the exciting world of packaging, probably a bit of Rust, Python, and all the related stuff. So yeah, welcome, Wolf. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm great. I'm very excited for this week. It's the week of packaging con and I'm organizing it or I'm part of the organization committee. So, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. What does that entail? Packaging con. First time I hear about that. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is to bring together all the different package managers and package manager developers. So like we're trying to assemble people from like the NPM world, the Python pip world, the Conda world. Uh, there are a bunch of C++ package managers like Conan. And uh, also, of course, like Docker and all these technologies, Nix, NixOS, uh, Linux distributions, and we all share sort of the same problems, if you look at it closely. Um, and so, yeah, basically packaging con is an effort to bring everyone at the table and uh, listen to a bunch of talks and try to learn from each other. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice, yeah. So that's going to happen here in Berlin, right? I saw it uh, earlier. 10 yeah, 6, uh... that is uh, happening basically uh, on Thursday. So in two days from now. Nice. I'm not cool. sure when we will publish the podcast, but uh, if it's early enough, yeah. maybe go there, uh, <laughs> check it out. Otherwise, uh, I guess there will be also recordings online, right? So maybe yeah, we can for sure. put that in the show notes. Yeah, the, we will upload everything to YouTube. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess that can be called a win, right? Uh, as we usually start with wins, uh, or it's going to be a win, I guess. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, yeah. Um, I can just continue with the wins. Um, I just came back actually from Spain, from uh, offsite, with uh, where I was able to meet Bob and Julian in person. So nice. uh, if you ever get the chance, uh, they don't bite. At least for me, it didn't happen. So uh, really, re it was really nice to not only see Bob and Julian in the general setup. Uh, online but now for the first time since we worked together even in person and did some good sports my legs still hurt <laughs> uh, and otherwise did a lot of content that you will probably soon see as a listener nice yeah it was super nice and uh, think a related win uh, we went together to a volleyball match with my daughter and they lost but it was one of the strongest opponents in the competition and they played very heroically they really really made it difficult on the best other teams although they lost they had a lot of mindset and uh, it was a great match and it was cool that you joined me Roman and cheering hard uh, to support them so thanks <laughs> nice um yeah so uh just in general um maybe going more to the um python realm what do you love about python wolf uh so you're working obviously on python at least at some point uh, or sometime during the day um, what do you love about it and why did you choose to work with it? Mm. Yeah, I I think Python is a great language, like it's super expressive and it's very easy to like put things together, basically. Uh, I also have some criticisms of Python projects <laughs> where it becomes pretty cumbersome without typing, I think, if you have really large pro projects. And I mean, I have, try to work with projects that are like pretty old code bases in Python and that becomes sometimes a bit hard to follow. But uh, my background is from robotics and in robotics, it's usually C++ and Python. 
And so I've written a lot of Python in that. And then when during university, it was also one of the first languages that I really tried to get more into to build a little app. That app is called Apostrophe now. And uh, it's a Linux like markdown editor. And that was really fun. And that taught me a lot about Python. And yeah, I think also if you like dive deeper and really explore how dynamic Python is, it's also pretty fun actually. Um, but that also makes it really hard to do static analysis, which is uh, sometimes something that I would like to do better than I currently can. <laughs> So um, I guess that's also just uh, speaks speaks a lot, right? Like on the one side, it's um, the, what do you say in German, Fluch and Segen? Like yeah. it's great <laughs> that it's dynamic, but it also has its uh, disadvantages. And uh, yeah, that's always, a, um, I guess, a compromise to make, right? Like choose your suffering, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, you already mentioned that there are some th things you dislike about Python. I guess uh, package management is also somehow related to that. Or why would you otherwise come up with the idea to create yet another package manager? <laughs> well, so yeah, I think that's like, um, maybe I was already hinting at parts of this, but basically what we are doing or what I've been doing for the past like four years is trying to improve the state of the Conda ecosystem and Conda as a package manager, and it's mostly associated with Python uh, and data science. And it is written in Python, which is also like part of where my criticism came from for like these big projects that are really hard to kind of follow because Conda and Conda Build, which is another project of the Conda ecosystem that actually creates the packages has been growing for like, uh, I don't know, 10 years or so. And quite organically, uh, I like to say. Um, so the code base is a bit all over the place. And what I did with Mamba was to kind of re, um, reverse engineer it and rebuild it in C++. And we're doing it, uh, sort of for a third time now with the Pixie package manager that's written in Rust. And then there's an underlying library that's called Rattler. Um, so yeah. And, but the the thing like so because we're talking about python package management so i also always try to tell people that conda or or pixie or mamba for are not python specific actually like they are very uh, general package managers actually the they are not language specific so you can also manage r packages with it or you could uh, manage your julia installation uh, you can also get C++ and C packages from it and all these kind of things. Uh, and they are, at the same time, they are cross-platform. So they work on all the major operating systems. And and so I'm not really trying to only fix Python package management, let's say, but also really trying to build like something a little bit unique, which is a cross-platform package manager that works for any kind of package and any kind of language. Yeah, and I definitely feel some of that pain. I have gone through some of that pain just recently. Actually, I uh, installed CUDA on a <laughs> on, yeah. uh, on the cloud. Uh, and yeah, I guess uh, you're already smiling. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought I didn't do things properly because I, do, I I'm not doing so much machine learning, let's say, and so on. So I thought, okay, probably that's a better way. But then I saw these whole discussions on Twitter that uh, said basically, hey, the day when AI can uh, install CUDA in one run, then we are really close to AGI, yeah. kind of. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I uh, I use Conda a lot because what I like about Conda is that you get the Python ver uh, you set the Python version and you set all the dependencies, both the Conda dependencies and the pip dependencies, when you can kind of install everything with one command. So that's a nice part about it, I guess. But then also, uh, I guess when you dig a little bit deeper sometimes it's really slow and uh, then maybe you go to mamba for example or micro mamba and then it's super fast but then i observed that certain things were not installable or at least maybe i did something wrong but then uh it didn't resolve anymore with micro mamba so i had to use yeah. conda so there's like always a uh, always some pain let's say like again the pain you choose right and uh, now I started to try a pixie and it really feels like a mix between poetry and conda so really usable, really intuitive, uh, faster, like micro mamba maybe. Um, 
but also um yeah really pr practical and and you have all the different packages so yeah I'm, I'm curious to to learn more about that and see how that grows yeah yeah i think the poetry for conda was one of the taglines that we came up with initially um and really pixie is sort of like a mix of multiple projects that already exist in like the conda ecosystem so there was already a project called conda lock mm -hmm. um and that's kind of what we are what we are very inspired from or also what we are using actually the same log file format for our log files. Uh, then the other project that we were inspired from is called Conda X. So that's for like global installs. If you want to install uh, some package globally, you can just do Pixie global install and uh, whatever. And mm -hmm. it uh, installs that package into a separate virtual environment that is um, unrelated to anything else on your, on your system. And so we're trying to find the best inspirations uh, from packages or like tools that are out there already and putting it into Pixie and uh, making it really nice to use. And uh, what I, uh, it looks or uh, feels a bit similar to what Sebastian Ramirez is doing on the um, backend side, right? With Fast API, he said, hey, I took all these inspirations from the different frameworks. And when the frameworks were created, these and these tools didn't exist yet. So um, of course, a lot of the things are now established and it's harder to change maybe uh, you have the luck to build a package manager from scratch basically right so um, maybe a related question is uh, how do you tackle something like this right you mentioned that you already worked in package manager in the past but how do you do something like this and how uh, does it look like to develop a package manager from scratch yeah so i wouldn't really say like from scratch it's is true but uh, I think a package manager also always comes with like another part and that's really the community around it. <laughs> so yeah. like the people that are creating the packages and package managers always live in some sort of ecosystem that supplies all of the things that you can actually install. And in that sense, we don't start from scratch at all because Conda Forge, for example, is like the biggest Conda channel and is completely open source. It's not actually affected by any like Anaconda licensing changes and things like this which is also another common sort of misconception. Um, and it has over 5,000 individuals that are creating these uh, packages for us. Um, and so what, what you do to build a package manager out is, at least if you want to like piggyback on an existing ecosystem, is that you need to analyze uh, like how, what, how do the packages look like? Like what's the archive format? How do you extract them? How do you install them? How do you like make sure that they get into the target environment in the right way. For example, with in the Conda world, we usually create hard links. So you have one central package cache and then we like, like uh, only have one copy of the package and then only link it sort of into the environment so that you don't duplicate the, like don't use too much space on your disk and things like this. And uh, one of the hardest parts and that we're really happy with right now is uh, the solving. So PIP and Conda both use uh, some form of SAT solving, which is like Boolean satisfiability uh, solving. And that resolves uh, basically the best package versions that fit to all the other things that you want to install. Like if you want NumPy and Jupyter and I don't know, some version of Tornado, the web server, or fast API, then you need to figure out, like they, they usually share a lot of dependencies and you need to figure out what uh, what are the latest versions of all the dependencies that I can install uh, to make sure that everything keeps working. And we kind of took the time to write uh, a SAT solver that was very inspired by Libsolve and Libsolve is the library that we've been using in Mamba for a long time now. And that works really nicely. And our new SAT solver is called Resolvo. And uh, sort of the good things about it are that it's written in Rust. So it's like memory safe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's also much easier for us to maintain than Libsolve because Libsolve was really written in like C and very hard to read and understand C. And so we, we're quite in a quite happy place right now. And then the other exciting thing that we've recently done with Resolvo is build sort of another package management library that's like the low-level tooling that's called RIP. And RIP is a Rust-based replacement for PIP or like implements all the logic that you need to resolve PIP packages and also install 
pip packages from PyPI. And that's kind of the next exciting thing that we want to integrate into Pixie. Seeability, like what you already mentioned, uh, that you use Conda and then you mi mix some pip packages in into them. So we also want to make sure that that use case is covered so that you can also install PyPI packages or pip packages into your Conda or like Pixie environment, let's say. So the memeability is then uh, rip pip. It's kind of, uh, yeah. <laughs> or uh, can you yeah. say that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So nice. yeah, our image is a is a wheel that makes a burnout. You know. <laughs> it's like ripping. okay, okay, nice. Yeah. Um. Actually, that's a, a good thing because I just uh before I played again with uh, Pixie and um, so the way you would install it would be you create a Pix uh, Pixie in, in it, right? Um, to set yep. up the Pixie project, and then afterwards you can Pixie add packages. And right. uh, if you already have a requirements file, you would just install it as well with um, Pixie pip install minus r requirements. Or how would how would that work? What's there the best practice? It's, uh, let's say it's not yet 100% defined how the interaction yeah. with uh, PyPI packages is going to look like. But I think like it's like we will most definitely add another field to the Pixie Tommel for now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you define your PyPI dependencies there. And then it's in your Pixie Tommel file. And then also it's going to appear in your log file. So Pixie log file will also have support for the PyPI packages because that's really one of the key things that we want to do is always have this log file so you can reproduce your environments in the future mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of know exactly what's in them and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, maybe we should talk uh, just briefly about the Pixie Tommel file. Um, because, uh, like before there was only this environment YAML file, but that's kind of limited because you can only mm -hmm. specify channels and dependencies mostly. Um, and so with Pixie, what we're doing is we have this Pixie Tommy file and it's very project specific. So you make your project and you add your dependencies. And then another thing that you can do is you could, you can add tasks into that uh, Pixie Tommy file. And a uh, task can do something like, uh, you can define a task that's called start and then start does something like Python app.py or something and then starts like fast API or whatever, or any other random thing that you can think about, like prepare some data or run some pipelines. And the other cool thing is that tasks can also depend on other tasks. So you can make a little sort of script. And then the third cool thing about tasks is that they are completely cross-platform. Uh, so we use something called Dino Task Shell, which is used by the Dino project, which comes out of like the JavaScript world. And luckily it's also implemented in Rust. So we were able to pretty much uh, immediately use it. And it uh, implements a like simplified version of bash syntax uh, because that was or is always a pain to kind of have the Windows support um, mm -hmm. that uses quite different syntax or expanding environment variables and all these kind of things. So using Pixie, it's very easy to create these cross-platform tasks. And uh, I think that's going to be a very powerful building block for the future. It makes it all, also uh, easier to build your package and then share it with others, right? Because that seems like you can just run one command and then it, it ta uh, yeah, basically runs an arbitrary yep. uh, amount or complex number of tasks that uh, Test things, um, maybe do some uh, setup or so, and then run the run the app, for example. Um, yeah, that that's definitely like our big sort of goal is that you just do a git clone, whatever repository, and then you do pixie run start, and it will get you everything you need. Like if you need a Rust compiler, if you need a C plus plus compiler, uh, if you need like Python three point twelve. Yeah. It can it can just go fetch all of that uh, with the right versions from from Conda Forge or PyPI and um, uh, get you going basically with with the project and get you developing or using whatever you have just Git cloned. Nice, yeah. I guess that uh, already opens up the question for uh, how to best go into Rust and and uh, also Python and and what would be some advice there. But maybe just one uh, question before that. Um, what is your experience building Pixie in public? Because uh, I guess you have posted it a couple of months ago that um, this is what you you have already planned or started working on. And since then, I experienced your way of developing really kind of public, like showing, okay, this is the progress and so on. 
uh, how does it uh, feel like from your perspective? Yeah, I I've been quite lucky uh, in my life, so to say, uh, that I have had the opportunity to build open source projects since like roughly five years ago when I joined Quantstack, which was the company that I used to work uh, before, where we did a lot of like where Mamba started. And where we also did a lot of open source in the Jupyter space and also C++ was like a library called Xtensor, et cetera. So, I mean, I am kind of like an open source person, but now I guess. Um, and building public is, uh, to me, at least a really nice way to kind of collect feedback very early on. Um, and we have, well, we have people that are kind of like very eager to try all the new things that we are like bringing out and it's always really motivating and cool to see and i think the entire team is super motivated whenever someone comes and says hey i've tried pixie and it's working or even if it's not working it's always great to see people trying it and um, yeah just getting the experiences and i mean we are doing this to make a tool that works for a lot of people and uh, really kind of changes hopefully changes the game a bit in terms of uh, how people do package management so we need that feedback and i think it's really a mistake to sort of uh, think that you know best what you're doing in that sense like it's really a mistake to kind of just isolate yourself from everyone and then just like work on something for two years and then uh, ship it and then you realize okay nobody actually wanted this so we're trying to do it the other way around yeah, I think that's critical. And like you have a piece of art that uh, doesn't isn't used in public, but people will be like, "Oh yeah, that was this uh, this yeah. one guy who had this idea about how package management <laughs> should look like." And <laughs> no, but uh, that sounds good. Um, also, uh, there are a couple of other new kids on the block, right? Like uh, I heard about Rye. I didn't try it out yet. Um, I mean, poetry is one that we, of course, already tried, but I kept going back to Conda because I just needed it for some um, data science libraries and yeah. so on. So do you want to make comments on the other uh, packages, uh, package managers that are out there now, uh, maybe how you differ differentiated uh, or how how you see that develop maybe also synergistically and so on? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we had, we're talking to everybody who was trying to do package management for Python and Rust. <laughs> There's like a group of people. Um, and I think, uh, and that was also really important to us to, kind of ship rip um, because the idea is that if we all like, or at least our idea or motivation is that if we all collaborate on the same sort of fundamental core libraries, like the resolver, like uh, installing the packages and this kind of stuff, we could make sure that we are all compatible uh, on like, like on the Python side, you have pip, which is like the standard, right? And so what we maybe trying to do is like with rip maybe have that same sort of building block that is pip on the python side and then we have rip on the rust python side uh, and if we all build on top of it then pixie would be compatible with whatever rai is doing and whatever like some other implementations that might or might not happen do so i think that's our motivation and that's also why i reached out to armin again to tell him about the rip and see if he would be interested in trying to use it in in rai um, because yeah, I think if we um, achieve some sort of like widespread usage of this low-level library, then that would be great for Pixie because we could make sure that you know we work, uh, we install the same packages in the same way. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really um, uh, inspirational. Actually, that <laughs> it's not always needs to be against each other and the fight and yeah. so on, but we can see like, hey. What's the common ground where we have the same opinion, let's say, how things should be done? And then maybe we have different opinions on how to build on top of that, but at least we can syner create synergies on those levels where, where we have the same opinion, actually. Um, yeah. And yeah, gain from that. Um, yeah, so you mentioned already, I mean, you have been working on Python for a long time now, also some Rust, I guess, right? Uh, that uh, anything that you would uh, recommend uh, people new to Python or, or also to Rust, how would you learn it if you would learn it again uh, these days? I So I think for me, and that's also how I learned Python basically or any other like programming language, I always start with a project and then I kind of bang my head on the project for, for a little while. Um, and that's how I, I don't know, like learn Turbo Pascal back in the days. 
oh <laughs> uh where we were trying to build like a breakout game or a, like sudoku solver this kind of thing so i i think my approach but i mean it's always a bit unique to the person is to think of some interesting problem that I would like to solve or some little game that I would like to do uh, and then uh, just um, try to learn by doing. And I think with Rust, like it's kind of nice because they've really been able to have some good tooling around the library. So you have Cargo and you have Rust up and these tools that make it easy to get started and install it on your system. Um, and then, yeah, just do some developments, read tutorials on the internet, um, watch videos and uh, get better. Nice. I mean, Always we didn't something. prepare this, right? But this fits perfectely to our PDM program <laughs> where we... <laughs> We always say choose two to three apps and then build them. And uh, we as the coaches help you get unstuck because as a developer, of course, you get stuck. And it's also yeah. important. It's an uh, important part of the learning. But the question is just how long do you get stuck and do you get so stuck that you are not uh, motivated to continue anymore? And uh, then just being a bit, maybe getting some guidance on where you'll find resources or just problems we already have, for, uh, have solved ourselves. And we can give some hints on how to solve them uh, more efficiently or with less pain, let's say. Um, that's exactly uh, part of the program. So, like, uh, yeah, how do you say uh, Vorlage in German? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that's also like the most fun way to learn, right? Not only the effective, but uh, then you can really show an app to your friends and or family. Yeah, yeah. and if you're so, ready, please contribute to Pixie. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the next question I would have asked exactly. Talking like, about uh, uh, yeah contribution, right? Like, um, what advice would you have for? Um, open source developers or aspiring open source developers be it contributing to Pixie or or something else? Um, yeah, I think like just to walk through like the, the way that I think open source is like a new contributor that comes, like usually what I think they should do is like read through the existing issues, maybe find the ones that are good first issues. Um, or write one issue of what they're planning to do because that can also already help a lot usually to kind of figure out if if that would be going in the right direction or not, like if you want to develop a new feature. And then my other recommendation is maybe to open a pull request as early as possible. Mm -hmm. So you can get a lot of feedback early on and don't be afraid of like basically sending an incomplete PR or one that's not working, I think that's I'm much more appreciated if you like do something early, communicate a lot about it, uh, come to our Discord channel and uh, yeah, talk to us. Uh, we are sort of always there as we have, like we also use it for our like internal company communication stuff and so on. So, uh, and uh, yeah, basically what I said, um, we are ha happy to help people also to get better at Rust in that sense. So if you want to do some open source contributions and uh, you're stuck somewhere and you open a PR to to Pixie or Ratla, Ratla or any of our other repositories, we're always happy and eager to help you. Ever bought a course and saw zero results? I've definitely been there. Uh, there are very great courses and materials out there, but if you don't implement, nothing will change. But with PyBytes Developer Mindset Coaching, it's a whole new game. In just 12 weeks, you transform from a Python intermediate to a pro. How? Through one-on-one -on -one coaching, building real applications, and mastering advanced Python techniques. Our hands-on approach isn't just about learning, it's about doing and achieving. Get certified, boost your career, and join an empowering community. Apply for the PyBytes PDM program now. Check out the link in the description below. It's really good to hear. Awesome. It's also something that we say to our clients, like uh, some of them said, yeah, I only make the PR when I'm already done. And <laughs> I'm like, no, please. Like there are companies who say that, right? Uh, then that ask you to do like comparisons between Git branches if you have questions. But I prefer to do the PR really early on. I mean, you have these work in progress tags and so on. It's just, I mean, the basic, the very basic thing would be after the issue where you hopefully have defined really well what should be implemented. You could, for example, create a PR in which you just implement the tests. And then with the tests, you can further um, refine the requirements, right? Like, hey, it should yep. be a function that if you put in four and two, uh, it returns six. It's a summing function, right? It's 
and then afterwards you can do the actual implementation so um yeah that's really good to hear that also from yeah. you yeah. and opening issues yeah not only going by the existing ones but also open new ones yeah, yeah. awesome Nice. Yeah. Otherwise, regarding the Discord channel, I actually, uh, in preparation of the podcast, I uh, wanted to quickly check how easy it is to install uh, CUDA with Pixie and it <laughs> worked rather good. But I also came to a, a short um, block, let's say, and I went into the Discord, uh, Discord server and I actually found exactly a thread where this question was uh, um, taken cool. care of and answered. So that was pretty good. Uh, so yeah, yeah, go check out this Discord server if you're listening. We can also uh, really put it to the test next week with a code clinic and go deep and then uh, see if we have any issues or, or enhancements. Right, Robin? Nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good. I guess uh, like a couple of small, I have some couple of uh, lower level questions, which we could have a look at, um, but maybe first some, some more higher level, which are maybe more interesting. Um, one of it being uh, Pixie AI. <laughs> Everyone is doing generative AI somehow now, right? Some packages already leverage it in their products. So yeah. uh, Prefect, for example, now they came up with a small AI that uh, whenever you have an error in one of your pipelines, it uh, tries to give a good um, root cause. Uh, what could be the reason? Pulumi AI is this thing where, you, where it suggests you how to set up AI, um, like um, infrastructure with AI. Do you already think about something where uh, AI could come into play? Uh, like, I mean, the dream would be, hey, I just install packages and if there are version conflicts, then it just changes things automatically and I just make a coffee and 15 minutes afterwards, everything is installed or somehow. But I guess it's th that sounds really complicated. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I've uh, actually like recently had this discussion with, uh, on like there's a project called RoboStack where we're building all the robotics packages for like the, into conda packages essentially so that you can install them with pixie and uh, we have a collaborator in australia who is a researcher uh tobias fisher and he was looking for like uh interesting things to work on and maybe related to like package management and sat solving and there are projects where they use uh basically you can guide the sat solver like you can tell the sat solver explore this package next or explore that package next or uh, things like that. And that kind of changes sub subtly your solution because you reach maybe different sort of local mm -hmm. maxima or minima and things like this. And so that could be an interesting idea to apply AI, apply AI to if, if you really want to. Um, we want, What we try to do for version conflicts is to print really human-friendly error messages that might also end up being AI-friendly if you paste them yeah <laughs> so it could be interesting to sort of like take the error message and then like let ChatGPT derive something even easier from it or have our own sort of simple algorithm but it's not it, that that part i think it's not really so interesting to us right now mm -hmm. uh one hard problem in package management is building all these packages and that's obviously different from like the pip world where in the pip world you basically have the author of the package usually being the the person that also, or the author of the software also being the person that makes the package, where in like the Conaforge world and also Linux distributions and, and things like this, um, the people like volunteers are packaging the software for Conaforge. So, and that includes software where we might not even know the author and that has nothing to do with the Python world. And uh, like, do you need CMake? Do you need auto tools, et cetera? And so one thing we've been wondering is like, can you take a random Git repository uh, and let an AI like run over it and figure out, okay, this needs CMake, this needs a C++ compiler, mm. this needs like boost as a library or I don't know. And then generate sort of, because in Conda we have these recipes. And so generate a recipe from, from a Git repository. So that's something that we might be looking at at some point. Nice. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Yeah. I guess, Bob, regarding the package management, did you have some more uh, questions or um, in general? Because that's something, of course, our, uh, we also face re frequently. Yeah. I think this has been uh, pretty exhaustive, like uh, the link with poetry, the Rust side, the inspiration, um, where Wolf inspired it on and its features. I'm I'm pretty uh, satisfied with, with all this uh, <laughs> this info. I don't have any remaining questions about that. Yeah, maybe just the last one regarding the existing packages. So I saw on the prefix side, you have uh, both Mamba and um, and Pixie now, right? 
So what is the future for the tool or for, for especially for Mamba, I guess? Um, would it be somehow integrated into Pixie so that you can, uh, that is also another question that you can, for example, just create a Pixie environment based on an NFYAML, uh, like from the Conda days? Or um, how, how does that look like? Or will Pum yeah. Mamba soon uh, part from us? <laughs> Uh, no, Mamba, I don't like it's definitely not going away. Um, so there are some things happening. Um, like Conda, for example, they have started to, or like a while ago, actually, they've started this project called Conda Lib Mamba Solver. Mm -hmm. And that replaces the internal solver of Conda. That was also the part that was relatively slow and the part that Mamba really improved upon with the Mamba implementation that uses Libsolve under the hood. And that's a project that is going to be uh, basically shipped or turned on by default in like a few weeks from now, or maybe when the podcast comes out, it's already has happened. <laughs> um, yeah. And that is like basically the continuation of the Mamba story, but uh, because Mamba started out as this uh, Python project that was like a hybrid between Conda and some C++ parts. Mm -hmm. um, and then Mamba itself is going to sort of turn into a pure C++ project where the like the Python parts of Mamba are going to be sort of like, if you want to use Python and Mamba, then you should use Conda, Conda Lit Mamba Solver. If you want to use Mamba Mamba, that is like uh, sort of like derived from Micro Mamba but mm -hmm. as shared libraries, which has some benefits for like updating and stuff like this, um, then you can continue to use Mamba and uh, Micro Mamba. And then Pixie doesn't really have the goal of uh, doing what Mamba does in terms of like having uh, environments that have a name and are like located in different places on your system. Like with Pixie, we are focusing on the same vision with like just you have your project, you have your Pixie Tomlin, you have your Pixie log file and like make that really work nicely for this like project specific use case but there mm -hmm. are people that legit legitimately have this uh, use case where you want to have like multiple environments like stack them or like have them really live independently or have kitchen sink environments and so we're not like super keen on adding that into pixie what mm -hmm. could happen is that we make like another project that's based on rattler as like the rust open source libraries that we also have and um but uh, yeah, I, I think um, we're working pretty closely with Quantstack and Anaconda on like all these uh, Mamba related developments. And we are going to meet in, uh, tomorrow for dinner with all of them. So that's going to be fun. And yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's good to know that they're like the core developers kind of of the package management and so on meeting and exchanging thoughts. Yeah. Um, so that we, the <clears throat> developers that are rather just using these tools and are happy that they make a lot of improvements, uh, can focus on that and, and the package management gets always smoother and smoother. Yeah. So which books are we uh, reading currently? Um, Bob, do you want to start? <laughs> sure. I had a podcast yesterday with adam johnson so i'm still um, reading his uh boost your uh get dx so yes uh, some really great books with about the developer experience tooling and stuff and on a completely different note i'm also reading the um story of art by gombri Combrich, i think it's a german name right uh yeah something entirely unrelated but definitely just uh, interesting history of uh, art and stuff so uh, yeah what about nice. you guys I when I went uh, when I was at the airport in Spain, I saw this book and I wanted to buy it anyway. And then I saw it was in Spanish. <laughs> well, if you can see this, but uh, I found it a super good idea to buy it in Spanish to uh, finally uh, improve my uh, Spanish knowledge a little bit. Um, so just in the same philosophy, let's say to look into different programming languages to and inspire yourself here and there. Uh, maybe also look into other human languages. Um, and yeah, I guess the interest in Elon Musk drives the, <laughs> is the motivation to learn more Spanish in that case. Yeah. Interesting book. Yeah. And, uh, you also do like highlighting and stuff, right. And then you can, uh, yeah. have some GPT upload photo, and then you had a whole, uh, easy trans <laughs> vocabulary training translation, right? 
Yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah, cool. Did, did you already try to speak Spanish with ChatGPT? Uh, not yet. No, that's a good question. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's really crazy. Uh, I that think it's the nice. future of language learning. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, what am I reading? Um, well, I've been reading this uh, book of Rust, the Rust book. That helped me quite a bit. And then uh, we're also working quite closely with Martina Lochengo. And I have a book that's called Loft. And so that's about uh, tech products and how to make tech products that people really like. So sounds nice. good. That's sounds how we're like going to write that out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Otherwise, um, if you want any last words for how you envision Python in 2025 and maybe Python package management. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm like personally. Okay, like I think I'm pretty excited about Mojo and these kind of things, like uh, how like compiled Python is going to look like and how fast can we get and stuff like this. Like that is one of the uh, areas where I'm kind of interested in because like what I told you before, like I used to work on that numeric library in C++ and uh, I kind of like tried to really go to the limits of what C++ can do. And so I'm curious what Mojo can deliver and how nice it will be and so on. So I think that's where like I'm currently most maybe excited about in terms of like Python development, even though it's not really Python. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. I guess uh, with that, we can pack it. And uh, well, it was really amazing to have you on the podcast. Uh, looking oh. forward to Pixie development. And uh, yeah. I like now I finally looked into it. I'm I'm uh, convinced, so I will use it and let awesome. you know if anything breaks or, or please do. Doesn't work smooth. <laughs> yes, yeah. any feedback is appreciated. Very exciting, and uh, thanks for sharing a lot of a uh, lot of cool stuff uh, yeah. we've discussed. So uh, thanks for uh, hopping on our podcast. Definitely. And good luck. And maybe we can grab a coffee here in Berlin soon. Yeah, <laughs> let's do that. Yeah, nice. All right. All right. See you. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this episode. To hear more from us, go to pybyte slash friends. That is pybit.es slash friends and receive a free gift just for being a friend of the show. And to join our thriving community of Python programmers, go to pybyte slash community. That's pybit.es forward slash community. We hope to see you there and catch you in the next episode.